Thank you. It is um, always an honor to be at CRIMP. This is an exceptionally promising, I would say, enterprise. We've had really engaged discussions, and I think this is a really exciting way to close the World of Work Partners Day. <clears throat> My research agenda, more broadly, examines the screen production industry as an exemplar case study of the ways in which gender inequality interacts with key features of precarious work, ephemeral employers and workplaces, networked freelance labor markets, hiring processes that exist outside of anything remotely resembling human resources policy, unregulated and antisocial work hours, professional development programs and promotion frameworks that are best characterized as entirely absent, and high levels of employment and income insecurity. The screen production sector also presents an exemplar case study to examine institutional experimentation intended to promote equality, diversity, and inclusion in industries marked by high degrees of precarity. My aim today is to explicate the ways in which we might begin to interrogate some of the policy experiments in the equity, di diversity, and inclusion space more generally using the various policy experiments underway in the global screen industries as the case study. Despite massive amounts of data that we now have to prove the point that male advantage is a defining feature of work in labor markets in the screen production sector, there is no clear consensus on what the root causes of the problem are. This is in itself a problem. If we fail to get to the root causes of the problem, the experiments we undertake will inevitably fail. We often start policy analysis with an examination of the policy instrument that is being deployed in relation to a particular problem. Yet how we understand a problem in the first place shapes how we choose to act upon it. Carol Bocci's What's the Problem Represented to Be? policy analysis approach offers us a window into how we might begin to interrogate policy problems. WPR, what's the problem represented to be, starts from the premise that what one proposes to do about something reveals what one thinks is problematic or needs to change. Following this thinking, Bocci advances an important and compelling explanation of the need to account for the ways in which policies and policy proposals contain implicit representations of what is considered to be the problem. The application of Bacci's framework in the context of gender inequality in global screen industries is to query the object of a policy intervention in order to evaluate the logics that underpin the policy rationale. Thus, we can begin to evaluate how these experiments conceptualize the root causes of gender inequality in the screen sector as an underexplored theoretical frame that influences the ability or likelihood of the current experiments to promote long-term industry transformation. So we are drowning in data that tells us we have a problem. For example, the percentage of female directors worldwide is about 16% on average. I'm now gonna briefly present you with two pictures of what gender inequality in the screen sector looks like, just to provide some context. As production budgets get bigger, moving from short films on the left to independent features, episodic television, and feature films on the right, <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> the number of female directors drops dramatically. The story this picture tells us is that men have disproportionate access to leadership roles in the most prestigious and challenging projects, 
they also have disproportionate access to the finance capital that fuels them. What is truly remarkable and indeed chilling is that this pattern is evident across jurisdictions around the world. So the inverse relationship between budget size and the likelihood of a female director being attached to a project is described by Stacy Smith and colleagues at the Annenberg School of Communication. She runs an institute called The Inclusionists, and it's fabulous. She calls this the fiscal cliff. The fiscal cliff phenomenon is an effect of the justification of systemic gender discrimination as a risk management strategy through hiring practices. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Professor Deb Verhoeven's data visualization here describes the relationships between male producers in the Australian film industry over a 10-year period. The pink dots represent men who only worked with other men in the key creative roles of writer and director between 2006 and 2016. The green dots represent producers who worked, male producers who worked with one woman during this period. That's how low the bar is set. 89 men in their data set, male producers worked exclusively with other men in key creative roles in this period. That's about 40% of the total pool of male producers altogether. So this is just a snapshot of the data, and there's much, much more. But I'm not here to talk about the data today. I'm here to talk about the proposed experimental, uh, the institutional experiments that aim to solve the problem. And the good news is that the systemic gender problem in the screen sector is at least acknowledged as a problem. But where things get sticky, as I said in the beginning, is how the problem is being conceptualized by a range of very well-intentioned national and subnational public policy and funding bodies around the world. And this is where Bocci's WPR framework becomes very useful. My key argument that I'll advance today is that the uncertainty and lack of clarity around what the root causes of the problem are have produced three distinct types of policy typologies that are intended to fix the gender problem in the screen sector. They are, I have titled them, people and pipelines, diversity and discoverability, and inclusion and representation. So the rest of my presentation is going to look at presenting the key features of each typology, and then I'll consider in turn their implications for systemic change. Okay, people and pipelines. This typology uses human capital arguments. The ideological framework is a quality of opportunity that draws upon highly individualized and marketized logics and mobilizes meritocratic discourses. The fundamental premise is that you fix the women, not the system. It protects the core function of the system as intact. It is an add women and stir approach. The outputs of this typology are programs like training and professional development, mentoring, job shadowing, networking programs, and so forth. And what are the indicators that we use to know if this typology is working? I think this is wonderful. I just love it. Uh, we look to see if there is an increase in public funding applications by women, for example, or we tell powerful stories about women's individual career trajectories as markers of success. This is, without question, the most popular typology it is certainly the least contentious typology, and preliminary evidence also suggests it is the least effective. There does not appear to be any meaningful relationship of any of the bodies of research that I have found and I've read broadly between training and professional development and gender equality and labor market outcomes. If change is occurring, as a consequence of these programs, it is happening so slowly or at such microscopic levels that it is indiscernible to see its impact. 
And possibly at worst, as one recent interviewee said to me, these types of programs makes the industry feel as if it's solving the problem, when all it's doing in the example of job shadowing for directors is fundamentally promoting free work for women. The second typology is diversity and discoverability. So this is an approach that operates at both the organizational level as well as at a policy level. So private corporate policy as well as public policy. The logic here is that the pipeline itself is okay. So I would say we're making progress, but the talent is not being acknowledged. In short, private capital simply does not know what it's missing. And once it realizes how great women and racialized minorities are at telling stories, things will change. So they need a nudge. And the best way to nudge private capital is in the form of subsidies and incentives. This is fundamentally a carrot rather than a stick. How does this manifest? In support by a range of industry players, including unions, for things like diversity tax credits. This is typified by a quote from Neil Dudich, the Eastern Executive Director of the Directors Guild of America, who is championing a diversity tax credit for the New York film industry. And the quote here is, Neil said, by encouraging studios, networks, and producers to discover the talented New York TV directors and writers that are out there in abundance, this bill can be a meaningful step in establishing a level playing field for all. How do we know it's working? Performance indicators and things like diversity and hiring practices and workforce composition. But I would suggest that we need to ask ourselves some really hard questions related to this framework, this typology. Is making labor even cheaper for private capital a robust long-term strategy for promoting good jobs? Does this promote the value of the work and the already marginalized worker, or does it promote tokenistic short-term feel-good hiring gestures? Well, let's turn to some evidence. Earlier this year, Darnell Hunt at UCLA released a report that examines diversity incentive programs for black writers in Hollywood. One of the key findings of the report is that showrunners often cycle through writers of color for a year or two, replacing them once the diversity program stops paying their salaries so that the show can save money by hiring a new junior writer whose salary would be paid by the diversity program. Okay, the third typology is what I call inclusion and representation. And the point of departure for this typology is to address structural problems within the system itself. It values the social dimension of screen stories and views inclusive representative screen industries as a precondition to social and cultural citizenship. The objective here is equality of outcome. And the mechanism is through the redistribution of resources, in particular public resources. What's interesting about this is the policy object is the industry gatekeepers themselves who do the hiring and make the finance decisions, the risk management framework. The way we see this manifest is in things like gender-based funding programs, in particular, like public funding bodies. And what is the outcome of this? Well, for example, in 2015, Screen New South Wales announced what is now an increasingly popular global program called 5050 by 2020. We want 50% female directors by the year 2020. One year later, Screen Australia, sorry, not Screen Australia, <laughs> Screen New South Wales, announced that all TV drama series must now include female key creatives on their team in order to receive development or production finance. The end. So in 2014, women represented 22% of directors and 26% of writers in New South Wales funding decisions. In 2017-18, women represent 45% of directors and 50% of writers. They're ahead of schedule. 
So the evidence from these three very different approaches of conceptualizing the problem of gender inequality in the screen sector result in three very different policy experiments with highly variable outcomes in terms of scale and speed of change. So let's take this back to how we understand our own challenges here. As we navigate our way through understanding institutional experimentation and what that might mean for the institutional experiment that is the CRIMPT project as well. So to do this, I'm going to draw upon the very storytelling industry that is the focus of my research to propose a vision for the future. This is one that flips the lens in understanding the problem, but it also flips the lens on who the agents of change are traditionally represented to be. Patrick Stewart is best known for his role as Captain Picard of the Starship Enterprise from the Star Trek series. The story world for Star Trek was set in the United Federation of Planets, described in the fandom universe as an interstellar federal republic composed of planetary governments that agreed to exist semi-autonomously under a single, single central government based on the principles of universal liberty, rights, and equality and to share their knowledge and resources in peaceful cooperation, scientific development, exploration, and defensive purposes. Importantly, Patrick Stewart takes this out of the story world and into our material world, effectively linking the two. The CRIMPT partnership model offers us an opportunity to create a vision of a federation of our own. Patrick Stewart has some useful ideas about how we might operationalize this, and I invite you all to consider how we can collectively position equality, diversity, and inclusivity as central to our agenda as well. Thank you. <laughs>